Fritz. Okay, and you're welcome to get going whenever you're ready. Okay, um, yeah, thank you very much, uh, Chris, for having me here, and I'm uh, really glad to be here to present this work. Uh, it's called Low-Rise Buildings in Big Cities, Theory and Evidence from China. So yeah, if you have any questions or comments, feel free to, uh, to just uh, ask any time during my presentation. Okay, so this paper is about uh, land use regulations, uh, which have been implemented around the world with uh, different forms. So in the US, there are like zoning policies. Uh, in the UK, there is a development control system. And in China, um, so there are like basically two types of uh, land use regulations design. So uh, at like a grant level, there is like a city uh, level plan. So basically prefecture level cities, they will have some five year, 10 year plans uh, for the city. And there will be uh, some land specific regulations. So in China, there is a land auction market. So basically uh, local governments in China, they provide land parcels to developers through a land auction market. And when they sell these land parcels, they will design very specific land use regulations for each of these uh, land parcel. So, um, so since land use regulations have been implemented around the world, and it has like different consequences beyond housing markets. So like one direct impact would be uh, of restrictive land use regulations would be like increasing housing prices and reduce housing supply. But land use regulations would also affect labor supply, economic development, and the uh, urban environment. So it's very important to understand the determinants of these regulations. So that's like one motivation of this paper. The second motivation of this paper comes from uh, basically two phenomena in China. Uh, so like in China, for big cities, superstar cities, there is a affordability crisis. Uh, so you can see like many media reports, it's really uh, difficult to afford a housing in Shenzhen, Beijing. And on the other hand, in the cities in the middle and the, in the Western regions, there is a phenomenon called the ghost towns. So essentially we have like many high rise buildings, but they are under occupied, they are left weakened. So I'm wondering like how come uh, within a country we have like so different two uh, phenomena. Uh, the housing affordability issues uh, in big cities in China seems to be driven by a lack of housing supply. Whereas in the, uh, in the middle and in the Western regions, we have all these um, ghost towns, which seems to be uh, driven by a oversupply of housing. So how come uh, we have both phenomena exist in one country? So that, that leads to the, uh, this paper. So in this paper, I explore uh, the determinants of a major land use regulation called floor area ratio limit uh, in China. So I first develop a spatial equilibrium framework to explore how local governments uh, face this uh, trade-off between the benefits and the cost of fire design. And the, uh, the major uh, prediction from the theoretical framework is that local governments with high budgetary revenue, so, some, so you could simply understand it as some local taxes revenue, the local governments with high budgetary revenue will design lower fire design to reduce the negative externalities associated with density. And then to uh, test for the major pr proposition of, this, of the theoretical framework, I employ a rich data site of land transactions uh, in China to study the impact of local budget on fire design and to address potential endogenous concerns I exploit uh, the exogenous variation generated from a central government's administrative adjustment policy. And I find consistent results uh, with the theoretical framework. So uh, what is far limit? So it's basically a major land use regulation specifying uh, construction density. So it represents the ratio of a building's total floor area relative to the size of the land plot which it is built upon. So if you look at the, the figure on the slide, so like let's say uh, in the first row, we have three different residential projects, but they all have the same floor area ratio, which is one. So far could affect 
both the building height and the lot coverage ratio. So if you have like a high rise building, uh, but you have like also many open space within that land plot, then the FAR could still be very low. So in general, it measures the density of a construction project. Uh, here I just show you like uh, two pictures of like the representative uh, projects with different FAR. So the, the figure on the left hand side shows a residential project with a higher FAR. So you can see that really you have many high rise buildings within that project and they are constructed uh, very dense. So, so they are like close to each other. And you could really imagine that if you are living in one of these buildings, uh, you need to bear with many negative externalities such as noise, pollution, congestion, et cetera. Uh, and the uh, figure on the right hand side just shows you a residential project with a relatively lower far. So you have like many open space, you have this uh, like green uh, park, uh, you could walk around and the density is very uh, low. So you could really enjoy your life if you are living in these uh, residential projects. So I um, so so I I want to ask like the determinant of the the, the major land use regulation far uh, in China. What I first do is I um, I just check the draw data. Uh, so the figure on the left hand side shows you the the map of the uh, budgetary revenue which represents local tax income at prefecture level uh, in China. And you could really see that uh, cities along the Southeast coast, which uh, include Beijing, Shanghai, all these superstar cities, they tend to have a higher budgetary revenue, which makes sense because you know these cities are like superstar cities. They attract many population, high skilled labor. They could collect many uh, like higher income tax. So they, so they are like in general richer. But if you look at the spatial pattern of far limit, so the map on the right hand side, you could really observe that. Um, so cities along the southeast coast, so these superstar cities, they tend to design like lower far. So they design like low rise buildings, whereas some cities in the middle and in the uh, west regions, they design a relatively higher far limit. So this really gives me this, like this uh, puzzle because usually we would expect uh, superstar cities um, having all these high rise buildings and uh, benefit from the agglomeration economies. Uh, whereas in, in China, we kind of observe the uh, opposite spatial pattern and I'm wondering why. Uh, Salon, can I ask a question um, yes, on kind of behind the scenes on this? Um, other than FAR, are there other sorts of meaningful building restrictions that you find in Chinese municipalities, such as other red tape and um, I don't know, you know, whatever my uh, things like, you know, can people fight about their neighbors building next to them? Other, other ways that that might kind of play out beyond this, just this regulation? Yeah, so I, so my personal view would be that FAR would be the, the most important uh, land use re local land use regulation mm -hmm. in China. Uh, sometimes you could transfer the land uses, like if this is a commercial use land, you transfer it to residential use, that would increase the housing supply, also increase the, the land value. But this is not very normal at a local level. So if you want to transfer the land use, you need to apply to the central government, which makes it more uh, complicated. There could be some other uh, restrictive uh, regulations, such as the ratio of green space within a, within a residential project. So you need, need to build like 50% of the land plot need to be uh, built with like uh, parks, trees. So that's another good measure, yeah. But I would say uh, FAR should arguably be the most important indicator of land use regulation restrictiveness. Okay, thank you. No problem. Um, so yeah, here I want to understand the determinants of uh, FAR in China. Uh, here are like some, just some institutional background. So uh, there is like a land finance uh, development model in China. So basically local governments in China, they own uh, these urban lands. They sell these lands to developers and they collect the land sale revenue. And the land sale revenue serves as a major uh, source of physical revenue. Uh, for local governments in China, it accounts for uh, around 30% to 65% of all the local governments' physical revenue. Uh, so when the when the local governments uh, design land use regulations or design FAR, they have like different motives. So one, uh, like 
apparent motive is the uh, externalities motive. So if you look at the scatter plot on the left hand side, it shows the correlation between population density and uh, uh, PM 2.5 air pollution. And you can see that as uh, population density increases, there will be more uh, air pollution. So it's not only in air pollution, but you can also imagine like noise, bad views, et cetera. So uh, if government only cares about negative externalities, they will design like lower FAR to uh, mitigate this uh, concern. However, there could be also other like benefits of higher FAR. So uh, if you look at the scatter plot on the right hand side, it shows the, 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 the correlation between FAR and the land price per square meter uh, using uh, over 300,000 uh, land transactions uh, data in China. So basically, you can see that like, if FAR increases, uh, developers are lo allowed to build a more quantity of properties out of the same land plot, and the land value will just increase. So uh, because land, land revenue accounts for a large proportion of all the physical revenue for local governments in China, uh, the local governments have the incentive to just design very high FAR and collect more land revenue uh, here. And of course, there is another uh, benefit of higher FAR. So basically, if I increase higher FAR, increase FAR limit, there will be more housing supply. So it will, people could consume more housing and uh, you know, that's a, like a benefit for, uh, for this regulation. But uh, from, the scared, uh, from the map before, we know that there are like many low rise buildings in big cities. So the question is how to explain the uh, spatial difference uh, in FAR design. So uh, to, 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 to answer this question, I just propose a, a theoretical framework. So it's essentially a Rosen rollback spatial equilibrium framework uh, with firms, households, local governments, and developers. Uh, households uh, make location choice based on the expected utility level. So here I assume like no migration costs. So it's like an open city uh, spatial equilibrium. People can move freely across the space uh, there is no migration cost, and in the end, they will reach uh, spatial equilibrium. So in every city, uh, the utility level will be the same for each household. Uh, I, I introduced uh, the role of local government uh, in this model to uh, to illustrate the process of land use regulation design. So here, I assume local officials in China having this incentive to maximize local population size and local uh, economic output. This is based on the uh, the very famous uh, the promotion uh, tournament model from uh, Li and Zhou in 2005. So essentially, they find that uh, local governors in China, if they can achieve a higher GDP growth rate uh, under their governance, they have like a higher probability of being promoted by the central government. So they have the incentive to attract more people, more firms to uh, to achieve a uh, maximize the uh, local economic. Uh, output. Uh, then in the model, I really show that local governments uh, trade off between the benefits and the costs of our design. The key prediction from the model is that local governments with higher uh, budgetary revenue uh, will design lower far limit. So, uh, uh, not for giving the time limit, maybe I just uh, like uh, quickly go over the the math. So for the uh, uh, here, first for the firms, I assume like a very uh, simple couple of dollars, uh, homogeneous firms using uh, capital and labor to produce uh, tradable goods. And from the uh, from the model, I get like the wages, uh, local wages W, which is really given by uh, some exogenous uh, determined factors at the uh, local uh, TFP level A. And uh, here I, I want to uh, illustrate the uh, the uh, migration uh, migration uh, behavior of households. So I uh, have this utility function for households. Uh, so the household so, so the household's utility is determined by the consumption of housing QH and other tradable goods QC, which follows a simple Cope Douglas uh, function uh, form, uh, plus some local public goods uh, G, which is provided by local government. Uh, you can think about some local public service such as schools, uh, hospitals, uh, etc. 
uh, G divided by L, L is the total population uh, level within the city. So, so people really need to like compete uh, for these uh, local public goods. Uh, plus uh, E, which represents uh, a negative externalities associated with density. So you can think about congestion, noise, et cetera. So that's the uh, utility function of uh, households, U. Uh, and and uh, to maximize utility level, household will consume like a proportion of its wages on, on, uh, on housing and the other proportion on tradable goods. Uh, here, I, I just model the, the local developers and the land market. And one thing I, so like one prediction from this uh, section is that uh, land price R uh, is determined by uh, the far limit F. So it's like a concave function with respect to F. Uh, what that is says, it means that as far increases, as far as F increases, land price per unit will increase. But land price increase, but the marginal increase in land price will decrease. So that's a concrete function because we could think about like the construction cost uh, will be higher if you are trying to build like a 100 story building. And at some point the construction cost uh, would be like getting closer and closer to the marginal increase in housing sale. So, so, it's, so the land price is like a concrete function with respect to FAR. And then I have like politicians. So basically here I have like local governments. Uh, they have like two different sources of physical revenue. So they have budgetary revenue B, which represents local taxes. And they have land sale revenue, uh, which is represented by uh, N I times R. So N is the number of land plots S is the uh, area, the size of the land plot, and R is the land price per square meter. So you get the budgetary revenue B and the land revenue, and local governments collect uh, revenue from these two sources, and they spend all their physical revenue on public good provision, which is G. So the, the production of G is, uh, again, very simple uh, production function. Uh, and then I, I have another component, which is uh, EF. So E represents the negative externalities associated with density. So EF here is a convex function. If far, if uh, far level increases, EF will increase. So it will bring uh, more negative externalities. Uh, Xiaolun, yes, uh, can I ask you a question on that previous slide? Um, so I was thinking, uh, is, is the treatment you have here where you have public goods that are being provided um, which increases as a function of the amount of property value in the, you know, in the metro, in the, in the region. Um, and then you also have externalities, which are decreased in utility. Yeah. Um, is this, would you end up with the same kind of implication in the model if you assumed that local governments were spending the revenue on public goods that are rivalrous? So what I had in mind here was it, it it's maybe more of a conceptual, like I'm trying to think about what's this really saying about, you know, who the government is working for. Yes. Um, because I, I was thinking on one of your earlier slides, like you had this chart where you had um, far on the X axis, and then you had the total amount of receipts, re government revenue on the Y axis. And of course, as they allowed more building, they were going to then have more aggregate intake in, rev in government revenue. But then on a per capita basis, I bet that as they increase far per capita intake is going to go down um, because the first properties that they get will be from those that yes. have like the most willingness to pay. So I wonder then, you right. So you can see how kind of then thinking like, well, on a per, if public goods are like kind of costing on a per capita basis or something, if you assume that the rivalrous, so one person consumes one unit of parkland and that parkland costs X amount or something. Is it, you know, in the end, basically, it sounds like they could, so I'm moving externalities out of this and instead of thinking about this in terms of rivalrous public goods. It sounds like the government is basically setting up like a type of, um, the government is finding the sweet spot where they're getting enough revenue and they're getting higher revenues by limiting FAR. And then they're able to also provide public goods from their high revenue that are restricted to a small number of people. 
does all this kind of square out in terms of like I, I know I you know I just kind of went on an extended yeah, that, 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 yeah, that, but that's uh, what makes, I think you're going sense. on to makes sense yes very interesting so yeah I think that's that makes sense and also like I think it really depends on the objective function of uh, local governments in China right so if they care about like let's say public good per capita then they are trying to find some optimal point right so they can having like sufficient public goods provided and having like some number of people and then the public good per capita will be maximized. Uh, so in the model, I assume like the, the objective function of local governments is to maximizing local population. That is based on the uh, literatures uh, from uh, the NGO. So essentially in Chinese uh, political economy system, local governments always care about like having more and more people living in their city so that they will produce more products, GDP increase. They have a higher probability of being promoted. Um, yeah, so that's like the objective function of the of the mm -hmm. model. Yeah, but also like the other point you mentioned like the, the land price, right? So if I increase, if I increase far, there will be more housing supply in the city that will uh, decrease housing price per square meter. But at the same time, I have like more quantities of housing being produced. So that's kind of like a, like a, like a mixed uh, influence to land price, right? Uh, what I assume in this model is that land price is like a concave function with respect to FAR. So as FAR increase, land price per unit will increase. This assumption is like in line with first by um, empirical like uh, data, mm -hmm. like which suggests if I run a, like a, if I estimate the elasticity, uh, for land price per square meter with respect to FAR, I always find like a positive coefficient. It is also in line with many uh, previous findings. Like for instance, there is a literature um, published in GOE, which says that the uh, developers always build uh, properties, which is like binding for the, uh, for the FAR upper limits. So it sort of suggests that the FAR limit is not, not always like uh, upper limits not always exist. The uh, the construction cost for the developers, so they are not, like always happy to uh, to build properties binding for the for the for the upper limits. Yep. Okay. Thank you. Yep. Thank you. Um, okay. So uh, here I, I just have this uh, like utility function for the uh, for the household. And I assume like uh, like uh, open city spatial equilibrium. So essentially, um, uh, at the equilibrium, every city will will achieve the same utility level. There is no migration cost. People are like uh, freely moving across the space, and uh, at the equilibrium, nobody will have the incentive to move. Because you could think about like if I have city A and city B. If city A has like higher utility level, then people from city B will just moving city A and it will increase population size, increase housing price, um, and they will compete for the public goods. So city A's uh, utility level will go down. So at the equilibrium, everybody will have the same utility level and they have like no incentive to move. Uh, so, uh, so, so, so this is determined by uh, the, so that means that the population size under the uh, spatial equilibrium is endogenously determined. Right, so I have like a U, U bar, which is like uh, the um, the utility level under spatial equilibrium, and then population size is really uh, endogenously determined. So this is uh, uh, suggested by the uh, equation uh, here in the slide. So basically, I have like three different channels uh, for the far to influence uh, utility level, but also influence like population. So I have like a supply effect. So you can see about, think about if I increase far limit, there will be more housing supply. People could consume more quantity of housing. That's like a benefit of far limit. There is a physical effect. So if I increase far, there will be more land sale revenue, more public good provision. So that's a, that another benefit, but there will be a, a, like, a like a cost of far designs. So that's the externalities uh, effect. So all the uh, negative externalities associated with um, uh, construction density. 
the, what I'm thinking about is that governments are really trading off between the uh, benefits and the cost of bar design. And they want to get the optimal point at which they could maximize the uh, population, local population size. Yeah, so that's the objective function of uh, local governments. And I could, uh, so here local governments want to get F star, the optimal far to maximize population level. And I could prove uh, that uh, the budgetary revenue B has a negative impact on the optimal far design F star. So the first derivative here is uh, negative. Uh, so how do we how do we think about this uh, like proposition intuitively? So basically, if you if uh, local governments they could collect sufficient income from other sources like income tax etc., then in this case uh, the 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 benefits the physical benefit of having like higher far and above land revenue land sale revenue would decrease right because they already have sufficient income from other sources, then they would put more weight on the negative externalities associated with uh, construction density, then they would design uh, lower far. If a government is like lack of money, so, so they would put like more weight on the, uh, on the land revenue, then they would rely, they would really uh, rely on uh, designing like higher far limit to uh, collect more land revenue to provide public goods. Um, yeah, so that's the intuition of proposition one. Uh, here I just like do some numerical analysis. So I make up assumptions on the parameters of the model. And here you can see like two different cities, uh, rich city A and poor city B. And so, so here I show like the correlation between far limit and the uh, endogenized uh, population size for each city. Uh, you can see like uh, for both cities, there is like an optimal point, optimal far level, so that they could maximize local local population size. But for like uh, rich city A, it will design a far level which is lower compared with uh, poor city B. Um, so there is another proposition from this model, which is basically uh, as budgetary revenue increases, local housing price will also increase. So this correlation is through two channels, one from the demand side. So if you have like more budget, more budgetary revenue, you are able to provide uh, more public goods that will attract more people and increase housing price. And also like if you have more budgetary revenue, you will design lower far that will decrease housing supply and increase housing prices. So um, that's the second proposition of this model. Uh, then I go to the uh, empirical analysis. Zalan, um, I have one more question. Sorry, I, I, it just came to mind now, and it's probably something that's quite elementary, but um, I was curious about it anyway. It's like, so some of these externalities, I imagine potential migrators are going to be visible to, such as, okay, we know that there's bad air quality in Beijing. So to yeah. what extent, you know, and, I, and sorry if I missed this, how it comes up, you know, manifests in your model, but to what extent is government regulation then necessary to, the, in this case, I guess it's actually well, I guess, okay, so so I guess for people to try to mitigate individually the amount of like smog in Beijing as a function of population size, they would have to say, I'm not gonna move there because it's gonna reduce smog there. Um, and it's not so much about the smog that I experience, but so much as my externality I impose on others. Is that right? So it's like a, a self-interested potential migrator is not gonna be attuned to that. And that's why FAR is optimizing that as opposed to individual decisions. Is that is that right? Uh, I, I'm not sure if I fully understand your question. So um, if I understand it, it's like, um, so like individual migrants, they also care about the, so why they, they are caring about the negative externalities, right? Yeah, so the, the uh, migrants should care about these externalities as well because it's affecting yeah. their utility. So yes. if, um, if, for example, externalities were really poor in Beijing because the, you know, the air quality is really poor there, uh, yeah. that should encourage migration out of Beijing independent of any building constraint, right? Independent of any government action. Um, so that's what I'm kind of, you know, I don't know exactly how this gets rendered, um, but that's kind of what I'm curious about. 
Okay, so uh, so he, this is something like I, I don't include in the model, but you, yeah, I understand like you could uh, include some like a mental measure or like some uh, like air quality measure in the model, which is exogenously determined across cities. And I add this component in the utility function. So basically uh, households are uh, not only considering about uh, the construction density, they are also considering about uh, other like amenities within the city. So that, yeah, that I could include uh, in the model, but yeah, so essentially it's like a, it's ordinary determined. So it's not uh, influencing the, the, the key prediction from this model, I guess. And then like empirically, I could control for this, like the air quality in Beijing. Uh, I could control like time wiring uh, city features, or I just add like one city fixed effects control for the like time invariant air quality. So yeah, I, I mean, I guess I was also thinking that it would be something that's a function directly of city size, right? So like the larger the city, yeah. there's some function of that is what's changing the negative externality. But maybe, you know, I, I don't want to distract you from where we're going. So maybe we could chat about this later or something too. Um, yeah, so th this also makes sense. Yeah, I totally agree. Like the externality function could also be uh, correlated with population size. So uh, so I didn't show it here, but in the model, I, I could also like do like endogenized, so like, E F here is not only correlated with the F, but also correlated with population size, and I get the same proposition. So yeah, so it's not like uh, like uh, like a concern for this proposition, I guess. Okay. But yeah, makes sense. Uh, yeah. Then to the empirical analysis. So I just have like. Uh, like the date, so the, the so the baseline estimation data comes from the, the China land website, land market website. So I get over one million land transactions in China. Uh, for each transaction, I get like very detailed and personal information, such as the transaction price, uh, the far limit, the size of the land plot, uh, a land quality measured by the government, etc. And I geo code uh, these land plots using their address information and. Uh, uh, Golden Map API, so it's uh, essentially like Google Map uh, in China. Then I collect data from other uh, sources like uh, county level data, prefecture level data uh, from like different statistical yearbooks. And I so uh, so I use a coincidental uh, experiment, which is called a, a administrative adjustment policy. Uh, to 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 infer the plausible uh, causal inference, and the adjustment administrative adjustment records com, comes from the Ministry of Civil Affairs uh, in the central government. Uh, here, I just want to uh, show you like how the data looks like. So here, I geocode all the land parcels. Uh, in China, you can see that it really have like a good coverage of uh, like the country. And so not only it has like some variation across cities, uh, it also has some variation within cities. So here I show you the land plots uh, within Beijing. So you can see, okay, so there are like some concentration uh, close to the CBD of this city, but there are also like some land plots uh, on the edge of the city. So uh, one thing I do in the empirical analysis is that I want to control for some time invariant spatial features for instance, the historical construction density or some geographical obstacles such as like a lake or mountain, because uh, these features suggest that the historical construction density could also influence land use regulation uh, today. So I want to control for these time invariant spatial features. What I do is that I create a uh, three kilometer times three kilometer grid, uh, and I control for this uh, grid fixed effect so that essentially I'm comparing uh, land plots within uh, relatively small geographic uh, units. Uh, and also like given the large size of, the, of my uh, sample, so I still have like on average uh, 10 land plots within each spatial grid, which uh, still allows me to do uh, some estimation. Uh, so another slide about the data. So here I show you the, the histogram of the, the FAR uh, in the uh, baseline land uh, based on estimation sample. So you could see that it's really between like one to eight. Uh, and uh, so you could see that there are some bunching around the uh, numbers. 
uh, the the figure on the right hand side shows you like how how the far uh, changes uh, with respect with respect to the distance to CBD. So in line with the uh, classic Bayesian curve, you can see that there is like a, the, a negative gradient uh, for like. So here I have like four superstar cities in China, four tier one cities in China, uh, which means that as the uh, distance to CBD increases, the the, uh, the local governments will design like lower far limit. So they will build like uh, less denser uh, properties, which is in line with the theory. Okay, so here I have like the um, baseline estimation. So I want to study the impact of local budgetary revenue on far design. So I run this uh, specification uh, with OIS uh, at a personal level. Um, here I control for like the grid fixed effects, uh, some time trends. Uh, I control for the land parcels characteristics and I control for some time varying city characteristics such as population uh, income per capita because um, there could be a story of sorting like uh, high skilled people, they prefer um, like lower far properties. And they also sort into like big cities, they generate more budget revenue. So to mitigate this concern, I control for uh, time varying uh, city income level. Um, here I just show you the OIS estimate results. So um, basically we could see that there is uh, the negative and uh, significant um, coefficients. You can see that, uh, like if you look at column four, it shows that uh, one standard deviation increase in budgetary revenue would decrease far by 0.06. And the estimates are robust using uh, both prefecture level and county level budgetary revenue. Okay, so there could be some endogenous concerns uh, for the OIS estimate, uh, for instance, the reverse causality because FAR could directly affect uh, budgetary revenue through uh, taxes related to land value, such as stamp duty tax and uh, land appreciation tax. And there could be some unobserved confounding factors. Uh, so I, I use the uh, grid fixed effect to control for the time invariant local factors, but there could be like some time uh, varying local factors, such as corruption, government quality, and some unobserved urban fundamentals that could uh, influence both the budgetary revenue and the FAR. So to address um, these concerns, I use a, uh, a instrumental variable strategy. So I exploit the exogenous variation created from an administrative adjustment policy. Uh, so I'm not sure if I have like sufficient time to, to discuss this uh, uh, yeah, I think policy in detail. Yeah. I, I think that it's probably time to start, you know, pulling things together and wrapping up. Um, but so okay. I would say go to like your last, maybe, you know, if you can get through the last two or so slides, that'd be good. Okay, so essentially I use like uh, this policy to, to address the indulgence concerns. And uh, uh, what I find is that, so perhaps here, so I, I use like a matching every uh, specification and I find like a robust and a, a larger estimate of the negative impact of local budget on far design. Uh, here I just test for the, the second proposition, so I, so which uh, predicts that cities with higher budget revenue would have like higher housing prices. And I find like consistent uh, uh, results. Okay, so to conclude, uh, this paper finds that cities with more budget revenue would design lower far limit for land plots. Uh, this uh, land use regulation design process would lead to uh, two different consequences. First, we have like low far limit in rich cities, which would reduce housing supply and the rising housing prices, and and uh, leads to some affordability issues. Uh, we have high rise uh, buildings in poor cities, uh, uh, which are like always left vacant, and uh, arguably uh, leads to like uh, some discussion about uh, misallocation of capital. Uh, so what I really find from this um, paper is that the land finance development model uh, in China is not sustainable and leads to uh, regional and wealth inequalities. So uh, regarding policy implications, uh, nationwide property tax uh, could do this job to 
both finance local governments and improve the uh, regional equality. Uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. And yeah, if you have any suggestions or comments, I'm very happy uh, to discuss later. Or if you could send me an email. Yeah. Okay. Thank you.